Hello and welcome to this webinar about stammering, diversity and inclusion. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, in the event of an alarm today, the fire exits are here and here. <laughs> Seriously, participants are welcome to put questions in the Q&A section. Uh, if you click at the bottom of the screen, we hope that many of your questions will be answered naturally through the structured bits of the webinar. And we'll try to pick up as many of the others as we can. And if there's time, we'll do a Q&A at the end. Uh, Stammer as an organisation are currently working on improving the accessibility of all our events. So we're trying to use Zoom's auto captioning feature. We know that it's not always accurate and particularly so for people who stammer. So please do bear with us. Uh, we're learning how to optimise the technology more successfully. This session will be recorded. Uh, and will be available via the Stammer website sooner rather than later for playback. Uh, but the, the delegates will not be recorded, only the people that are presenting uh, and speaking today will be recorded. So a brief outline uh, in this webinar, we're going to try to do something a little different than we've done before and really change the stereotypes around stammering at work. So rather than talking about how employers can help or support people who stammer, we're going to suggest that stammering is desirable in your workplace and give you some tips to attract people who stammer into your organization, because at the end of this, you will want them and you will want us. All the panelists today stammer, so please guys stammer openly. I know I am. Uh, we want to showcase our beautiful stammering voices. So um, we've got a brief uh, overview. There'll be uh, some general information about stammering. Um, we'll meet the panel and hear how stammering impacts and enhances their work. Uh, there'll be some tips on how to welcome people who stammer into your organization and create working environments uh, where they can thrive. Um, and uh, there'll be a Q&A at the end. We have planned two polls uh, during this webinar, one now and one at the end. You'll see the polls pop up on the screen. And we'd be really grateful if you, if you would respond to them. Um, and all, all poll responses are anonymous. So, Kirsten, if you could uh, start the first poll, you send out the first poll. But the question is, how many people do you know stammer in your organization, business or institution? You should see the poll on your screen now. Um, note to the panelists that only the, only the delegates can vote today. So we... We all uh, see stammering on the television not enough. That's one of the uh, one of the things we're trying to improve, trying to get more voices in the media who stammer. Um, but it's really interesting to find out how many of you um, know somebody at work who stammers. Okay, so uh, the the biggest, by far the biggest answer to that is uh, one person. So um, there's a few of you who don't know anybody. Um, so, as I say, most most of the of, of the delegates know one person, and some of you are fortunate enough to, to, to know between two and five, and and somebody even knows six people. So that's really good. It's good to know. But really, um, bear in mind that between one and three percent of adults uh, stammer. Uh, so, if you're not aware of anybody, and let's say you work in you work in an organisation of a hundred or more people, there's a fair chance that there's somebody in your organisation that does stammer. And if there isn't, then your organisation may be inadvertently excluding them. 
uh, or driving people to hide their stammering in some cases. So for a little bit of background, um, Stammer have produced a video that shares some key messages about stammering. Uh, and so please take a moment to listen to the beautiful voices you'll hear in this in this key messages video. Over to you, Kirsten. Hi, we'd like to share a little bit of information with you about stammering. Stammering is the way some of us talk. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just different. Stammering doesn't mean I'm nervous or unsure about what I want to say. It just means that sometimes it will take me a little bit more time to get the word out that I want to say. How much I Stammer varies from day to day and situation to situation. I, I'm, 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 using the phone or ordering in a restaurant challenging. As you probably can tell, <laughs> I find saying my name particularly difficult. Sometimes, actually quite often, I swap words so that I can get my message across. Sometimes I hide my summary by choosing not to talk or by talking less. Talking to someone who's stammering can be difficult when you're not used it. That's okay. Just hang on in there and be patient. Don't try and guess what I'm saying. Just wait and let me finish. Stammering is the way some of us talk. It's not good or bad. It's just different. Thanks, Kirsten. So th there's just just a, a little insight into the world of stammering for those that, of you that don't know much about it. Um, you can see there's lots of different ways that people stammer. No, no one stammer is the same. Um, all of us are unique and quite special. So now we'll move on to uh, speaking with the panelists. If you guys could switch your cameras on, I'll introduce you. And then we'll have a have a chat around stammering in the workplace. Hello, everybody. Okay, so we've got um, Sophia Williams, who's a clinical psychiatrist currently specialising in child and adolescent mental health. Um, <laughs> hi, Sophia. Hello. <laughs> I wondered, I, I wondered if you could share with us a, a little bit of, uh, of um, about stammering in your in your job, and really some of the the benefits that you found to having a, having a stammer. Yes, thank you. Well, as a as a psychiatrist, I'm a trained medical doctor, so through that I had to go through medical school and then work uh, work as a doctor uh, doctor before um, specializing in in psychiatry so i've had a lot of patient contact over the years um, now i'm working as a psychiatrist with children and adolescents some um, young people and actually i think i can be much more open about my stammer now i feel this is this is me, it's not going to change. And I think in a way it can be very positive because it can act as a real leveler. So the sort of doctor patient imbalance, which can be really unhelpful, I think is flattened when I open my mouth. And if I stammer on a word, sometimes I can sound really fluent and possibly no one would know, but it can just 
sever me, I can block or stammer. And so it's a leveler because the young person that I'm talking to also realizes that I'm vulnerable too. That it's it that it, it's not that I it, it's not that I need to tell them anything about myself. It's there and it's obvious. So it can act as a real. It can really um, benefit the actual uh, patient or client interaction. It can be a really po positive thing to help um, them feel comfortable and be able to express their own concerns about things or if they have um if they have been uh, if they if they're having difficulties in their mental health or they have a neurodevelopmental diagnosis on the on, on the autism spectrum or adhd they know that 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 i'm possibly more likely to understand them because of what i have to live with myself and so even yesterday i'm thinking you know talking to a, a patient it was really obvious that I was stammering, but yet they were quite comfortable talking about their difficulties and diagnosis. And they said, I think you really will understand. So I think it can be really positive, positive in that way, a great, a great leveler really. And also having someone in the workplace that stammers, I'm also, I also would really like to, if others are interested and other psych psychiatrist colleagues working with children and young people it's not something that is particularly focused on in our training at the moment or at medical school either so it's something that I'd like to talk about with them so that when they see and hear young people that they have in their clinics they may, might be able to help um, point them in the right direction and help parents and carers to understand when children, young people are having um, difficulties in speaking. That's brilliant. So it, it sounds like it gives you a real connection with the clients uh, yeah. and, and, and allows them to feel a little bit more at ease. I think so. You know? I hope so. And that's, that's the feedback I get, which is really but really for me very positive that's brilliant i think sometimes as a as anybody who's seeing a, a specialist in any field can feel a little bit overawed that, that, that who they're going to see is this perfect idol that, that you know so you're right it's really nice to be able to, to connect yeah. um with with the person who's helping you out yes yes yeah. thanks ever so much that, that, that's that's just a brilliant, Sophia. Um, the next is a man, Khan. Um, a man is a student currently studying mathematics, operational research, statistics, and economics. Sorry, a man. I had to read that. There was no way I was going to to remember the acronym Morse. So, <laughs> so uh, as a student. Um, certainly studying in quite a high level field how do you how do you find your stammer as a benefit yeah so when i when i was coming to university i, I think anyone with a stammer has thought about this is this idea that you meet lots of new people um new flatmates and you want to make the best impression with them and i also struggled with my first name so um, going into university in and of itself was quite a frightening experience, um, especially since all your life you've been you've been trying you've been told by people that this is a bad thing that you shouldn't stammer. So you, you so you try very hard to hide it. Um, now, when I started shifting my mindset to both stammering in my study life and my social life, that's when I think uh, things started to change for the best. Um, when I got to university, I wanted to make a mark on people because I felt like my stammer had helped me, had held me back from doing that throughout my entire life. So I was looking um, through the SU page and it, it said public speaking taster session. Now, obviously, as a stammer, there, there's nothing scarier than speaking to a large group of people. But I did go to the session and I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. 
and the people there were very open about everything. Um, I went to a few more sessions, uh, started to get quite good at it. Um, and then I had this desire that was driven much more by the fact that I was a stammerer that couldn't express themselves for most of their life, that I needed to be this amazing, perfect public speaker. And I can promise you, I would never have joined the society if not for my stammer, because that's the thing that actually drove me to it. As a result, I practiced and practiced and practiced. I was so determined, I think more so than my degree in those really high stuff, um, those really highly mathematical subjects, um, to, to the point where I was, I was doing it really late at night. So the first competition, I came second in the experience category, and I won the second competition. Then I entered the elections, and now I'm co-president of the society for public speaking. Now, all of these things would never have happened if not my stammer in the first place. As a result, I'm far more confident, far more expressive. In my degree, when we have seminars, um, I know that there's a classic... Um, people think that people who study maths and statistics don't really talk that much or they quite introverted. I'm by far the most extroverted person in my seminar and no one, at least no one else there seems to have a stammer, but I seem to express it far more openly. People talk to me. I make friends quite easily in my seminars, um, which is all great. Um, I would never have done these things if not for my stammer in the very first place. And I honestly can say that reaching this point with public speaking would not have happened without my stammer. In fact, in the very first public speaking session where we spoke to 70 people, I was like, I need to be vulnerable so they can trust me. I disclosed my stammer. I said, this is what I have. This is what I, this is what I do. I'm not scared. I'm not frightened. I'm not nervous. This is just something that I do. Um, then someone came up to me and told me that that was the most moving speech they've ever heard. And they felt like they really connected so I feel like being very open about my style has allowed me to be vulnerable and make really close bonds with a lot of people. Um, and I wouldn't, all throughout my life, I thought, what if I was born fluent? But I realized I wouldn't be the man I am today if I was born fluent. So you, you go right. I think I think that's something all of us feel. Sometimes we we are able to share our vulnerability because because it's quite difficult to hide it. Uh, as we've seen, we all have different levels of, st of stammering, but it's difficult to hide your vulnerability. So people, similar to what Sophia was saying, you can find a connection. So that's that's really good. And, and it sounds like your your public speaking training, because you felt you had to go the extra mile, is definitely given you the benefit of being a, a very good public speaker. Yes, absolutely. Like. Um... I think I prefer to be on a stage um, a lot more now than I ever used to be. I, I don't feel nervous anymore about it, which is, which is a massive step up. And even people who, do, who don't stammer feel quite nervous about those things. But I don't seem to feel that anymore. Brilliant. Well, it, it sounds like you're certainly an asset to your, your, your university, Aman. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul. So uh, our third our third speaker today is Mandy Taylor, um, who's a finance manager with uh, with an advertising agency. Hi, Mandy. Hi there, Paul. Thank you. I know, I know, I, I, I know Mandy quite well, and, and I know she's a very outgoing person. So I look forward to your your words. Can you can you share with us some of the the wonderful benefits that you've seen and, and, and your employee sees from you stammering. Absolutely. So um, I am head of um, finance um, for a marketing agency in Manchester. Uh, we are now one of the biggest agencies in the n n n Northwest, and I would be responsible for the time management um, and the finance um, across the whole um, agency. Uh, we have now got about 60 employees, but we also do quite a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work with outside agencies too. So normally finance is seen as one of the grey jobs that you sit behind the screen yeah. and you speak to anybody. But 
I wanted my job to become more visible so that I could support the people that I'm working with. Um, and so now we have got an awful lot of meetings that I deliver a lot of information, a lot of numbers. I also work um, at the senior management team where I have to give out a lot of, um, I guess, a lot of reports um, which have to be conveyed in a particular way too. But I stammer openly, but I stammer with confidence. It's not yeah. something yeah. that I find that people go, oh, you know, that poor girl. Yeah. I stammer <laughs> very, very honestly, but I stammer very openly and never apologizing for the way that I talk. So being confident in my approach, I have found that nobody has ever then seen it <clears throat> as a weakness. And I certainly, and my employers do not treat it as such. And in fact, living in England with a Northern Irish accent already gives me the edge, but chucking in the fact that I stammer, it's the icing <laughs> on the cake. In fact, my boss in many um, external me meetings, he always jokes in a very good way, bring in Mandy, because we will be unforgettable. And <laughs> that's where, I don't take offense at that. And I don't see that as them feeling sorry for me or, or you know, it's the fact that it's taken me a while to get to where I am, but I couldn't do that also without the backing of really good employers. And they get the best out of me. And that just works. But I find as well, my staff then find me, just like Sophia said, we are so much more approachable because yeah, we think in the armor. They can see it, but everybody has got something that makes us a little bit vulnerable. But the fact that we are open, th th then people can come to us with other issues that may impact on their job. And I'm seen as on one hand, a rather formidable, character that doesn't back down in any <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also the person that they can come to with any personal dramas that are impacting on their life because they have seen that I've had challenges that I'm obviously well on top of but that gives them an opening and they feel much more comfortable maybe talking to me than they would do talking to one of the other senior management teams. So I think it kind of gives us this strength, but it all no all but it always, always gives us that little bit of vulnerability too. And it's how we manage that. It's not up to anybody else to, I think, you know, you know, put that across for us. It's for yeah. us to be proud and say that that's fine. I stammer. I can handle it. Can yeah. you? Yeah. Exactly. Well, thanks, Mandy. You're, you're absolutely right. I think if when we work with our employers, when we have good management teams, when good employers, I think it definitely brings out the best in not only us, but everybody around us. So you're right. A, a key to this is a good uh, adaptable working environment so thank you thank you for highlighting that um so our, our final panelist today is natalie mortimer natalie's an apprenticeship and employment tutor hi natalie hello i i know you i know you work quite closely with young people um with young adults how how do you how do you incorporate your stammer into that and how and what do you think that brings to your role yeah so i have a bit of a dual role so um i uh, deliver a, uh, the apprenticeships to 16 and plus but then the other half of my role is that i am at the send lead 
So that's working with learners with special educational needs, learning difficulties, or disabilities. So, with my tutor role, working with my own learners both on a one-to-one -one basis and group workshops, I definitely find that uh, because I stammer, obviously learners need to be slightly more engaged and tune in to what I'm saying. So, so I, I definitely find that engagement is really, really good and like uh, some of the other panelists have said, it can really help with breaking down any initial barriers, you know, learners may be apprehensive about how their learning journey is going to go or if they have any learning difficulties or uh, uh, barriers to work, uh, because that's the because that's the other thing my learners aren't only learning but they're learning on the job so um so we have to look at both sides of the coin there are there any barriers to learning and are there any barriers to how they uh, progress in work and more often than not I'm then uh, communicating with their employers and I think that you know, not just exposing my learner to somebody who stammered uh, but also their employee their employers as well is it that's obviously a, are going to be positive and I deal with so many different kinds of businesses and workplaces that the more people that are exposed to somebody who stammers the more awareness there is then as part of the send role I'm then dealing with learners across the business who require a reasonable adjustment to their learning as well as their workplace and I think that because I face my own barriers within learning and employment myself I'm in a really good place to advocate um for my learners especially when speaking with their employers and i also have to work with all the tutors to make sure that they have reasonable adjustments in place and i just think that it, just again like other people have said we are we are instantly more approachable yes. and we can just so quickly just break down any barriers that are there. Um, and like I've always said, no, no one wants to argue with someone who stammers. So <laughs> that's, that's definitely a benefit that I, I certainly hadn't thought of, of Natalie. I think, I, I think you took the words um, of my mouth there at, at the end, you, 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 you can really act as an advocate for your learners, especially going to their employers uh, and show, you know, show your, as we've talked about, show your vulnerability a little bit to their employers and show them that it's not a bad thing. So, so that's, that sounds wonderful and you're doing a, a great job. So thank you very much for sharing that with us this afternoon. Right, thank you. 
So, so th- th- thank you to all the th- to all the panelists. And hopefully, you're going to hang around if there's uh, any time for Q and A at the end. Um, it was a very insightful session, and hopefully, it's given you all something to think about. Um, we're certainly all very approachable. Some of us uh, more approachable because of our positive vulnerabilities. Um, sometimes we don't like to use the word vulnerable, but certainly in this case, they're positive vulnerabilities. And we're all, every single one of you has shown an awful lot of confidence in your role. So if anybody out there was to think that somebody who stands lacks confidence, then we've absolutely blown that out of the water this afternoon. So thank you very much. Um, the next the next part of this, um, Kirsten's put together a, a good little slideshow with some tips um, for um, encouraging a, a, a stammerer uh, into your workplace and um, both in the, in and how to help them both in the interview and throughout the work day. So, Kirsten, if you want to go do those slides. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. And if there are things that I've forgotten, Paul, feel free to uh, to jump in. Thank you very much. So just thinking about um, just some basic suggestions and tips for ways you might welcome people who stand at your organisation and create organisations where they thrive and want to stay with your organisation um, for the long term. So I think... Uh, Sort of a, a key foundation of all this is remembering that the one thing that the people who are speaking in today's webinar have in common is that we all stammer, but we're all different. We're all different in the way that we stammer, and we're all different in lots of other ways too. So, for starters, I think it's remembering that we are all individuals. But when it comes to the stammering, and um, so don't allow stammering to become an, an exclusion criteria. So if you if you're if you have a particular job role which you are recruiting for, do not start with the basis of assuming that someone who stammers can't do that role. You've seen all these different people here today with all these different skills and experiences. Um, if you have any doubt about what people the sort of jobs that people who stammer can work in. Take a look at the videos on the Stamp Ambassadors website where you'll see uh, a whole range of people who STEM are working in, a, in an enormous variety of careers. Um, so that is a good place to start. We will send out um, the slides afterwards to, to, to the attendees of the webinar. So you will get any links that come up will, will be sent to you in the slides. Um, Cheryl has written a, uh, a piece about this in the chat I see, about the phrase, excellent communication skills in job adverts. It's something you see a lot. It's almost a standard thing to put in job adverts, you know, seeking candidate with excellent communication skills. I've, uh, I've come across that in my own workplace this week there was a, there was a job advertised uh, in a different department of mine and I, I have to be honest I, I rang the HR department and said what what are excellent communication skills and as as expected as we all know nobody was able to answer so they agreed to remove that from that particular job advert but you're absolutely right Kirsten and and Cheryl who's with us today uh, what excellent communication skills as we all know are far more than speaking or not so let, let's get rid of that if we can absolutely and and the reason we're recommending we bin off the phrase excellent communication skills in job adverts is just because it might pop off people who stammer from applying in the first place you might be missing out on some really good people because they're like oh well they're just excluding me from the off so we're suggesting instead that you replace that with a clear description of the communication skills required for that job. So if you need people who are good at persuading customers over the telephone, then write that in your job advert. If you need people with excellent written skills to, to convey complex technical information, then write that. Be specific about what you're looking for. 
Um, and there is um, the article linked in this point is to your article, Cheryl, about the campaign you ran talking to employers um, about that. So that's a really good read. Thinking about interviews, um, a really useful thing to do if you're wanting to welcome people who stammer into your organisation and you want them to be able to demonstrate to you during the interview process what they can do so you can evaluate whether which candidate you want for your job. Explaining the interview process to all candidates so not when they turn up, but at the point at which they're offered an interview, explaining what that interview is going to look like. Will it be um, an online interview, a face-to-face -face interview, or, or, or a telephone interview? Will it be a one-to-one -one interview, or might there be a panel? Are there, is it a standard question and answer interview, or will they be required to do a task? Are there time limits? Because if you, if you explain what the process is, and then actively inquire with your candidates if they will benefit from any adjustments to that process. That's going to allow your candidates again to really show you what they can do. And some people who stammer are going to be absolutely fine with whatever process you have set up. Some people who stammer might explain when you invite them to, they might explain, actually, actually, I. I may find it difficult to give you comprehensive answers in a telephone interview. I would prefer to do a video call or face to face. And then I find it easier to talk in those situations and, and show you what I can do. Some people who stammer might say, say that's fine. However, if it's very time limited, I might find it hard to say everything I want to say. If you're going to limit me to 90 seconds per answer, for example, and you can then adjust around that so you can evaluate this candidate fairly and objectively. Thinking about both people who might be coming to interviews and um, within people's work roles, intercoms can be a bit tricky. Uh, lots of people who stammer might find intercom access to buildings very tricky. In, imagine if you're someone who stammers and you turn up at an interview and you have to use an intercom to get into the building. We saw in the video earlier that some people who stammer out find it particularly difficult to say their name. Imagine you pressing the intercom button, somebody working on reception answers, and you're struggling to announce yourself. It can be really difficult, and if it's a regular feature of your job, accessing buildings by intercom. Again, there might be adjustments that can be made to that so that people can just get on with their job roles and not get stuck in these holding loops just about accessing buildings. So consider alternatives. Are there other ways to access the buildings or other ways to identify the person? We get quite a lot of calls on the Stammer helpline from people who, who tell us that now that GP surgeries often have intercom access because the access is more restricted following COVID, lots of people stammer phoning up saying, I can't get into my GP surgery because the people working on reception think somebody's ringing the bell and running away when actually I'm just trying to say my name. Um, and continuing on the introductions theme, again, some people who stammer will find introducing themselves challenging. This might apply to uh, people who are starting new jobs and meeting a team for the first time, but also often applies in meetings. And Paul, you and I were discussing this the other day and you described very eloquently that experience of um, introducing yourself in a meeting. I wondered if you mind just mentioning that. Yes, uh, um, we've, all, we've all come across the the round table introductions where you expected to say a name and either an amusing thing or a little bit about yourself um, and even fluent speakers uh, uh, view that with horror. Um, imagine the, imagine when it, there's 10 people around the table and you're number eight and everyone comes to you, you, you get a little bit more nervous, a little bit more uptight, a little bit hotter in the face. So those that are organizing that maybe if you could either not do that at all or not go around the table perhaps let people say when they're ready so somebody who stammers might want to go first to get their 
um, name out there, get understood. And what I do, I always introduce myself, but I always tell people that I stammer at that stage. So everybody in the audience, everybody in the room knows that I stammer. And then it's not going, it, it takes the, it, it's not the elephant in the room for me any longer. So that's one way of getting around those introductions. Thank you, Paul. That applies also in online meetings, thinking about turn taking, which can be even more complicated in online meetings with any delays or disruptions or the fact that when you're looking at lots of faces on the screen, it's not always simple to predict who's going to speak next. Thinking about turn taking in, in, in online meetings is good. And just the final point I just raised for today, just thinking about creating these stammer friendly work environments for people where telephone work is part of the role. Um, many people with stammer are perfectly comfortable using the phone. Some people find that more difficult. And if it is a, uh, if it is a large part of their, their work, what some people with stammer might, uh, might find more comfortable is being able to make business related um, calls where they're not in front of an audience as well. So it's just them and the person on the other end of the phone um, so perhaps just having a quiet place to go away to make the phone calls they're doing as a part of their job. So these are just a few ideas just to tune you in to ways of adjusting environments to make them really welcoming and then attracting people who stammer to, to your business and organisation. Um, but stammer, we do have a website and we have information for employers and for employees and we also have a helpline and web chat service. Um, if you're an individual or an organisation who's looking for support or you're actively wanting to work on making your, um, your organisation's environment more stammer friendly, we do work with organisations on reviewing um, HR policies and procedures, on doing um, training for line managers around creating stammer friendly environments. Do, so do contact us if you want to have a chat about uh, about collaborating with us so that we can we can support you um, in that work. OK. Thank you very much, Kirsten. As you can see from the slide that's on the screen, it's how we talk and many of us do have excellent communication skills. So we are running right up to time. Um, so I'm just going to run, a, 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 if we could just run one more quick poll before we leave. Uh, there are, we have had one or two questions. Thank you very much for those. Um, what I'll do, um, I think Kirsten and I are okay to stay on. I, I don't know if, if one or two of the panelists could hang around for a minute. We'll, we'll answer one or two questions right at the end if we can. But um, if you could look at the poll, how useful have you found the webinar? Hopefully you've all found it, 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 it useful. I know it's been really interesting for myself and Kirsten putting it together. Um, sometimes when you when you think about these things with, with, um, with a purpose, it certainly it clarifies um, your understanding of that. So uh, I'd like to... Uh, Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, everybody, to uh, especially the panelists, Sophia, Mandy, Aman, and Natalie, who's had to rush off. Um, your words were very insightful today and very eloquently spoken. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, it is, as, as you know, uh, I, I hope you know, today is International Stammer Awareness Day. There are various uh, various videos and webinars that are going on throughout the day arranged by uh, Stammer and other organisations. Um, certainly the focus this year is to get more stammering voices, more beautiful, eloquent stammering voices heard in the media. And not just today, but there are 365 days of the year, not just one. So um, if you go to the Stammer website, uh, stammer.org you can find out more information about that so thank you very much everybody um so so, so for those of you that, that are still with us um there was a, a couple of questions 
um, that came in earlier on. Um, um, just to say, so the panel, I don't, I don't know if anybody wants to pick this up. What changes would you like to see organizations make to their HR diversity, inclusion and recruitment policies to be more welcoming to stammerers? So I, I think that the essence of that is what, how would, how would we like to see companies embed in their company policies uh, to be more welcoming to, to stammerers? Um, if I could, um, Mandy, would you like to? Ross, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think one of the things that was mentioned in the, the in this in the slides, um, it's the fact is that HR departments should be actively asking, do you need any extra requirements, any additional things? It shouldn't have to be requested. Because I think sometimes people feel if I ask, that gives me a black mark. I think it should be asked to every single applicant because, you be, because there could be other people as well that don't like to have to give a um, presentation in front of many uh, panelists. They they might have a time limit. That time limit could be extended. Um, it could be done with only maybe one of the panel. There could be various things that that could be useful there. Um, but but definitely, I think that 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 should be offered to all um, applicants and shouldn't have to be requested. I think that's that is actually what one of the um, changes that we have made, um, and also for the intercom, we've got a big building, a big old one, the big heavy doors, and we can't just leave them open. So the HR um, girl who's doing the interviews asks the applicant to text them when they are. Arrive so that so that she can go down to the, the door and actually meet them face to face. So there's just that's little, a great idea. Yeah, yeah, just little things that make everybody feel more comfortable, not just people that stammer. And I think that's a very important part. Is we want to be on a level playing field with everybody else. That's, that's all we're asking. That's all we're field. asking. A level playing field. Would anybody else like? to come in on that. No, I thought it was a cracking answer, Mandy. <laughs> it was a great answer. Thank you. I, mean, I think sometimes it, it might be up to the person in the, in, the, in the actual role to be quite creative. I can remember being in a job in a particular hospital where it was a very large room to make lots of phone calls and I, I was finding it tough and then I actually found a sort of it was actually called a booth on the lower floor so every time I had to make you, you know um, quite long complicated phone calls I used to go and find that booth I felt um, yeah and I, and I think it, it might have been helpful if I'd actually mentioned that um, because perhaps then that could be thought about. So I guess it, it can be up to us to be creative, but then be quite proactive, suggesting that as an alternative in the future. Yes, yes. That makes That's sense. A, absolutely. Sometimes we have to advocate for ourselves. You're right. Yes. 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 Um, another question that is linked to that is somewhat from a recruitment perspective, given the rise in virtual interviews and sometimes without video, what support can we provide ahead of the interview for hiring managers and for candidates? Is, 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 is there any way we can make the actual um, hiring process a little easier for it? bearing in mind that uh, quite a lot of interviews these days is done via, done via Zoom or Teams. 
Um, I think I, I think we touched on that a little bit in the notes, just giving the candidate as much notice as possible of how the interview will be held um, and just asking them if there are any reasonable adjustments that can be made. Kirsten, have you got something to say on that? Yeah, my other thought, in addition to what we discussed before, so I do quite a lot of work around, um, as, as Mandy mentioned at the moment, often the requirement is on the individual to request the adjustment. People often aren't aware of that they can and are worried that that will count against them. So might not make the request and then might not actually show what they can do in that interview. So quite a lot of the work I do in my role at Stammer is around um, kind of supporting that um, communication between the individual and the employer to discuss reasonable adjustments and, and one of the things that's um, been quite effective for lots of people is actually the opportunity to give some information to the interviewers about stammering in general about what stammering might look like for that particular person so and and how the interviewer should respond to that so that the interviewers have that information as they go to meet the person and the person knows that and then that the interview can then carry on but you've created this sort of framework of expectation and that has been really useful so so yes so i think like that's having that um openness that the interviewers themselves might take it might just be 10 or 15 minutes to watch a video of information yeah. or to read a letter, but it's got some information about stammering in general and for that individual. That's a, that's a brilliant idea. We've got, we've got a comment from Cheryl King. Um, thanks, Cheryl. She, she suggested that we give a copy of the interview questions uh, to interviewees. Um, that's for all interviewees. And sometimes it depends whether you listen to or read the, the questions. So, so then, I guess, ahead of the interview, it takes a little bit of pressure off uh, somebody who stammers to to have know what to expect a little bit rather than an, an off the cuff question. I think I think there will always be that question that follows on from. Um, from an opening question there's always the follow-on that's the basis of an interview but i think Cheryl, you're absolutely right to give to give a, a, somebody a, a good framework it's a great start and a great adaptation mandy you've got your hand up your virtual hand <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, over this last year and a half, we've actually employed uh, probably 20 staff in, in the, the, this way. And um, what we've started doing, because um, we found most people have found it a very strange ex experience. And what we actually do now, the interviews have normally got a panel of two, maybe th three. So the HR person would actually open the interview just with the one, with, with actually just her and have a very inf informal chat first just to make sure the person's comfortable. How are they doing? Have they got any distractions that they might have, like children running around mm. naked or something, you know? Um, and just put them at ease. Just have yeah, that yeah, yeah. few minutes just to get them settled and then introduce the, the other, other, others. And we found that that's worked really, really well. That's a great idea, yes. So you kind of, as you say, put the person at ease right at the beginning of the interview. And that goes for stammerers and fluent people as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, I think we're coming right up to the end of our time now. So just thank you, everybody, once again. Um, and I hope the delegates have found it useful and can see there are 
many, many benefits to hiring a person who stammers. Um, and with a few changes, uh, that person become can bring a new dynamic to every team. Um, our ideas and contributions can come from a different perspective and our voices certainly deserve to be heard. So thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. Bye-bye.